Today on Blue 58, it's time to recap days two and three of the 2019 NFL Draft. Who did the Packers add, and will they make a difference on this year's team? Let's jump right in. Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast to thepowersweep.com. I'm your host, John Meerdink. Happy to be with you here post-NFL Draft. Your families still love you. Have you said hello to your loved ones? You might want to go do that. You are back to work or heading back to work on a Monday after all. Hello on a new Monday edition of Blue 58 Special One to recap what happened this weekend. And what a weekend it was. We already gave you the breakdown of day one of the NFL draft, the first round, a wild one for the Packers, and it really didn't slow down on days two or three. Let's start with day two. And would you look at what the Packers actually did? I predicted that they should go with an offensive lineman in the second round, or I guess proposed that they go with an offensive lineman in a second in the second round, and then potentially a tight end, or maybe a wide receiver in the third, and look what they went and did. They took an offensive lineman in the second, and then tight end Jace Sternberger in the third. That's pretty close to me doing an actual mock draft and pulling off a couple pred- correct predictions, and I don't count at all on that happening again. I guess everybody gets lucky now and then. And there you go. That's what happened for me. Um, But I like both of these picks. And just at like a 40,000 foot level, this was a good names draft. Elton Jenkins and Jay Sternberger like, sound like two polar opposite names. Elton Jenkins sounds like a senator. Jay Sternberger sounds like the almost can't believe it name of like the male lead in an ABC family show. Jace Sternberger wouldn't sound real if you saw it on TV. But here he is, a member of the Green Bay Packers. Let's go kind of pick by pick in order here. Elton Jenkins, number 44 for the Packers. Picked at number 44. We don't know what number any of these guys are going to be yet. Let's talk about likes and dislikes for every one of these draft picks, though. Uh, For Jenkins, there's a lot to like here. You like his versatility. I think it's interesting that the Packers are taking a guy and moving him outward from his traditional position. Usually they go inward, like a tackle moving to guard and so on. And he seems to have the ability to do that, though, move outward from where he typically plays at center out to guard. And he has played just about everywhere on the offensive line. I would maybe pump the brakes on the he can play all five spots in the line sort of talk because that just seems like an almost impossible thing for a guy playing at the NFL level. But if he could play all three interior spots, that's probably a win. And even if he was just a really good backup center, perhaps a starting center at some point who's passable at guard for right now, that's probably a win for the Packers, though they almost certainly are going to want more than that from their second round pick to be sure. You also got to like his athleticism. He's a very good athlete for a center, elite level athlete for a guard, according to relative athletic score. And getting any kind of second round worthy athlete for your offensive line is probably a win. But getting one who's six foot four and 310 pounds is a literal big win. That's a good size for an interior offensive lineman. Dislikes. This is kind of the flip side of the versatility coin. I wonder sometimes about position fit with guys who are pitched as being versatile. As great as being versatile is, sometimes I wonder if the Packers may be putting him in a position to fail. A guy like Elton Jenkins, that is. What is his role, really? Uh, Nominally, of course, guard, because that's what they say that he is position-wise when they took him. But he hasn't played guard full-time, really, in a long time. And are we going to do the play a guy outside his natural position thing again? That doesn't seem like necessarily the best way to do things, though he could be a very good guard. And this dislike is probably more a Packers thing than a Jenkins thing, but it does give me a little bit of pause. If you're right away, the first thing you want to do is try to figure out a different position for a guy than what he plays naturally, that's an issue for me. And I think it's a different issue than what the Packers are trying to do with Rashawn Gary. They say he's a linebacker. People are wondering about that because he played defensive end in college, really. The way that Mike Pettin uses his outside linebacker types, that's not a super big deal because sometimes they rush with their hand down anyway. This, though, does seem like an issue because, again, he's not a full-time guard and hasn't been in some time. He has played it in the past. He started there in the past at left guard, but that that has not been his role in a while. By trade, he's probably a center. The Packers got a pretty good one right now, starting at center, but they've needed a backup center for a long time. I guess, to bottom line it, you wonder if they're putting him, like I said, in a position to fail by not letting him do what he does naturally right away. 
small thing and probably not something Jenkins has a lot of control over, but maybe a question mark nonetheless. Jay Sternberger. Let's talk about the new Packers tight end. I like that he's polished in some key ways. He's almost always described in everything you read at him as uh, about him as a natural route runner, which is pretty great for a guy just coming out of college. That's one less thing you have to teach. And mastery of routes is something that a lot of a lot of young pass catchers struggle with. Uh, that was a problem for Equinemius St. Brown and Marquez Valdez-Scantling last year. I realize it's a different position, but I think the concepts are largely the same, especially for a tight end who's going to be playing a more wide receiver type role. I also like that he's a relatively late bloomer. I think you could spin this as a negative, but I think it shows that he's someone on the rise more than a guy who's peaked already. I'm wary of guys coming out of college who already seem like they are what they're going to be. You're just going to open up the tin and get whatever football players inside. Sternberger seems like a guy who's still growing and becoming the player that he ultimately will be, and I think that's good for where the Packers are with their tight end position right now. He's also very productive in college. Uh, He and Irv Smith out of Alabama were the only big-time college football tight ends who had 40 or more catches in last season and averaged 16.1 yards or more per catch. Not too shabby. Finally, I really like that he wasn't a first-round pick. Tight end was a popular mock draft prediction for the Packers in first-round mock drafts throughout the entirety of mock draft season, but they didn't spend even more resources where they've already spent a whole ton on a guy who's probably not going to be a super big focus of their offense anyway. That's a win for the organization. As far as dislikes for Sternberger, I really only have one. Because by the time you're getting down to 75, you got to start lowering expectations a little bit anyway. Third round, sure, you still do want a contributor, but you're not going to get everything you want in round three. That said, Sternberger is not the blocker I thought that they'd go for. My prediction, my hope, was that they'd get the best blocker they could, who met like 80 to 85% of their athletic thresholds. Well, they got half of that. Sternberger isn't the greatest athlete in the world. He was pretty good, according to what the Packers have tended to look for, but not great. Again, about half of what they were going for in that two-part equation. Not a super great blocker, not a super great athlete. Uh, So they, they didn't really get the blocking tight end I was hoping for, but they still got a guy who was very productive. And who knows what we're really going to see from Matt LaFleur and his tight ends anyway. I think there is a risk of over predicting a little bit what things are going to be like because he's really only had one year as the the man deciding what his offense was going to look like. So don't worry about that a whole lot. On to day three. My prediction, my hope for day three was that the Packers would just take a lot of athletic lottery pick type players. And without any picks in the fourth round, that's pretty much all they were limited to. And that's pretty much what they did, starting with Kingsley Kiki, whose name absolutely is going to make me giggle every second that he is in the NFL. Every time I have to think about Mr. Kiki, that name is going to make me laugh a little bit. I like his versatility. Uh, He seems a little bit like the defensive version of Elton Jenkins. He can line up a little bit everywhere. That's pretty good out of a fifth round pick. And it's different than James Looney last year because he's got the size to actually do it. That does, though, play into something I dislike about him. I don't like that he's had to change his body so much to fit into different roles already in his college career. The Packers haven't had a ton of success with guys who remake their bodies to move all over the defensive front. You can think of Mike Neal and Dayton Jones as two relatively recent examples of guys who have done that, or more accurately, failed to do that for the Packers. They didn't get a whole lot of production out of, the, out of either Neal or Jones, though Neal did stick around for quite a while. He was a great athlete. Uh, Just couldn't really find a final role. And that may be a coordinator issue. I think you see my broader point here. If you're already trying to remake your body to figure out what you need or where you can fit in in college, that's a little bit of a concern. That said, he is still a pretty big guy. Uh, He said this week that he's weighing in at 293 pounds, could probably go up to 300, 305, 310, something like that, and may even play much bigger than that. It depends what the Packers want him to do. And if he ends up being productive, it doesn't really matter. It just gives me a little bit of pause. He's also just a good, not great athlete. Length is really where it's at for him, uh, both height, although he's not super tall, and wingspan, where where he's actually fairly exceptional. Um, Though... He's still not a super great athlete. 
athletes may be not necessarily what you're looking for along the defensive line. Just good, not great. Still very good, though. You could have done, done a lot worse. On to the sixth round where the Packers pick Kadar Holman, a cornerback out of Toledo. I like his side speed combination. You got to like a guy who's six feet tall and runs a 4 3 6 40 yard dash. That's pretty good. I like that. I also like that he's earned pretty much everything he's gotten. Listen to the intro of his uh, pick profile from Packers.com. Quote, Kadar Holman had no stars, no scholarship offers, and no real hope of playing football past high school, but that's never stopped him from dreaming. A native of Burlington, New Jersey, Holman believed he could play at the Division I level. He just needed the opportunity and a better SAT score. So Holman clamped down his uh, academics, attended Milford Academy in New Berlin, New York, and worked odd jobs, unloading trucks for Dunkin' Donuts and cutting meat at a deli. He wrote letters and emailed highlights to every D1 head coach and assistant he could find. His perseverance eventually landed Holman a walk-on offer to play at Toledo University, end quote. First, before I move on, got to point out to the copy editors and writers at Packers.com, the preferred terminology is University of Toledo, right down the street from where I live. Everybody here calls it UT for that reason. Small thing. He played at Toledo. He's a rocket like everybody's favorite, J. Ron Elliott. All that, you know, that caveat aside, all of that may sound a little bit like sports journalism mumbo-jumbo, the feel-good story, the human interest stuff, but it's got to count for something in your makeup, right? There's something to be said about a guy who's almost entirely a self-made man. A self-made man who can run a 4 3 but a self-made man nonetheless. I think that's pretty cool. Dislikes. This one may be a bit of a stretch, but I wonder a little bit sometimes about small school corners along with wide receivers and running backs, but corners in particular. And we said that this in our previews of each of these positions when we talked about small school players. This applies to Holman a little bit. If you were really something special as an athlete or as a player, it seems like somebody would have found you at a bigger, more proven school than the University of Toledo. Why wasn't he playing at a bigger school? We all know that schools, well... Let's put it this way. If you are a legit athlete, if you are a guy who can really put it out there on the football field, your academics may not matter all that much. And we've seen that story play out again and again. So either his academics were really bad, or he may not just have been a guy that the bigger schools were interested in for other reasons. And it's possible, like Jay Sternberger, he was a bit of a late bloomer, but you have to wonder a little bit. And I realize we're talking about a six-round pick here, so, you know, grade that criticism on a curve a little bit too. Running back Dexter Williams. I like that he is athletic in the right ways as we talk about the Packers' second sixth-round pick. He's not a great high-end speed guy, but he's got agility and explosion. Good three-cone times, good vertical, good broad jump. That's pretty good. He's also got some decent zone running game experience. He says the scheme the Packers will run with Matt LaFleur is very similar to what he ran in college, he being Williams. I dislike that he was only productive for a single season, but that's a small concern. Again, we're talking about a sixth round pick. Also hard to like that he was arrested and suspended last year for drug possession, drug related issues, though he didn't really want to talk about that with the Packers beat writers uh, this weekend. Finally, the Packers round out their 2019 NFL draft with linebacker Ty Summers. I like that he's basically the definition of an athletic lottery pick type. And that is pretty much the best thing you can get in the seventh round. A 4 5 one, 40 yard dash at 6 one, 2 40, good agility scores. That'll do in the seventh round pick, or in the seventh round. And he sounds, for all the world, like a key special teamer just waiting to happen. The dislikes, nothing really. I mean... You're talking about a seventh round pick. Everybody, every team in the league has passed on a guy like this multiple times by this point. And any, I mean, you see why he wasn't a first round pick. Doesn't, I mean, he's a great athlete, but he wasn't super productive, wasn't playing on a powerhouse squad, wasn't getting the attention that he would have gotten for, had he played on one of those big time squads anyway. At this point any in the draft, you're just pre-selecting a guy you'd have tried to get as an undrafted free agent anyway. So the Packers were clearly interested in him, and they took him in the seventh round just to make sure that they'd have him locked up. Overall thoughts on the draft, and this is circling back to day one as well. Uh, the class overall has a lot of 
great strengths, athleticism being the first and foremost. Brian Gutekunst has shown again and again in the draft and free agency, in free agency in the season, that he wants athletes over guys that are that you just describe as football players. And you know what I mean when I say football players, guys that produce despite not having great athleticism. Ted Thompson was trending this way, but Gutekunst really kicked it up a notch since he's taken over. By relative athletic score, a number or a, a metric system, whatever you want to describe it as. This was the number three overall athleticism class in the NFL. They were The Packers are right up there at the top again, and they were right up there at the top last year. This is also a pretty versatile class. The first three picks, Rashawn Gary, uh, Darnell Savage, and Elton Jenkins can all do multiple things. More than that, they are known for doing multiple things. And that's, I think, different than just being able to do multiple things. If Gutekunst is known for athleticism as his primary focus, versatility is number two, and it's pretty close. Finally, I like that they seem to draft, seem to have drafted the right players at the right time. I wanted another big guy early. You got Rashawn Gary, a big edge rusher, with their first pick. I wanted an offensive lineman next. Well, it didn't happen exactly next, but we got an offensive lineman who's Got great size and athleticism in round two. I wanted a safety fairly early. We got one in the first round, earlier even than I suspected. I wanted them to get a tight end, but not in the first round. And we got Jay Sternberger in the third. And obviously, this is not about what I want. But I think taking these players the where they took them reflected good positional value overall. If there's a weakness in this class, I do wonder a little bit of about... Oh, I do wonder a little bit about size with a couple of these picks. Athleticism and versatility can sometimes be a trade-off for size. Sometimes you have to be versatile because you're athletic, but you don't have elite size for your position. And I think that's the case in at least two picks, Darnell Savage Jr. and Kingsley Kiki. Neither of those guys are necessarily overwhelming in terms of the, the height weight aspect of their athletic profile. They're big enough to get it done, but you wonder how they fit in at the NFL level. Small concern, because overall I'm pretty happy with the class, but I think it's a fair question to ask. What does this class do, what does this class need to do, or need to be, to be successful for the Packers? I think it's really going to come down to the first two picks. They really need instant impact from these first two guys. I kind of feel weird saying this, but I think Pete Doherty has really the right the right idea over at the Green Bay Press Gazette at PackersNews.com. Here's his main breakdown of the NFL draft. A relatively, well, not lengthy, but medium-sized quote here. Here we go. Quote, Brian Gutekunst needs this draft to work out a lot like the last time the Green Bay Packers ended up selecting two players in the first round. In 2009, the Packers put down the foundation of a defense that helped them win a Super Bowl when former general manager Ted Thompson selected B.J. Raji at number 9 overall and Clay Matthews at number 26. This year, Gutekunst, the Packers' second-year general manager, had an extra first-rounder he picked up with a trade back in the first round of last year's draft. And after having to wait a year to reap the reward, he added two defensive players, pass rusher Rashawn Gary and safety Darnell Savage, to a free agent class that includes three new starters on that side of the ball. And while pass rushers are the most important defenders on the field, in this case, Gutekunst really needs the Savage pick to hit. The GM sacrificed two fourth-round picks to move up from the number 30 selection he gained last year to number 21, where he landed a safety he thinks has great skill and knows he has great speed. The Packers very much need him to be their next Nick Collins, whose career-ending neck injury in 2011 has left a huge hole in their secondary ever since. End quote. Now, he's mixing the metaphor there by bringing in Nick Collins, but overall, I think he's right on. The Packers need both Gary and Savage to be instant impact type players, but it's really Savage that could make or break this class. That's because you're expected to be a difference maker at number 12. But the Packers needed multiple difference makers in this draft, and if you're training up to get a guy in the first round, you better be a good one. I think there's a lot of pressure on Darnell Savage, and he, even more than Gary, I think, really needs to be the impact player in this first round. The other big question I have about this draft class was whether or not trading two fourth-round picks was a good idea, and I'm not entirely sure that it was. I think 
even if we can't decide right now, and we certainly can't. We're a long way from being able to figure out if this was a good idea or not. It's at least worthwhile to track down what Seattle did with the two fourth-round picks they got from the Packers. And what happened was John Schneider got incredibly busy with his trade ammo. He turned number 30 and numbers 114 and 118 into a bunch of additional picks. Number 47, Marquise Blair, a safety. Number 64, DK Metcalf, a wide receiver. Number 120, a wide receiver named Gary Jennings, a defensive back, a linebacker, and a running back later on in the draft. Basically, he took those two fourth round picks and multiplied them into six first round or six picks overall, including a couple guys that would have fit in pretty well with what the Packers needed. Now, I've argued for a while that the Packers needed a handful of difference makers as opposed to just a bunch of players, and I don't think they had room for 10 total draft picks uh, and probably not a whole bunch in the first four rounds. But I think there's always something to be said for taking more swings as opposed to fewer. And I also think there's a case to be made that it might have been better to just hang tight at 30 and let things play out and maybe trade up when the asking price was lower later in the draft. Say you took those two fourths and turned them into another second round pick and a third round pick. Of course, time's going to tell here, and the Seahawks needed a lot of help too, so maybe this is a win-win. But this trade, a little like I argued about Oren Burks last year, is probably going to be one of the perhaps most important defining stories of the 2019 NFL draft for the Packers. Overall, though, A satisfying draft for the Packers. They filled a lot of holes. They added depth at important spots. They drafted the right people at the right time, and they got a lot of good athletes too. It was fun to watch it play out. I hope you enjoyed it as well. I was thinking about you all a lot over the weekend and how exciting it was going to be to get in the studio Sunday afternoon or evening to talk a little bit about it with you, and I hope you have enjoyed the show because that's all I've got for you on this episode. I do thank you very much for listening. I really appreciate everybody who takes the time. If you liked what you'd heard and want to help us keep going, leave us a review and a rating on iTunes. That helps more people find the show. If you want to take your support to the next level, check us out at patreon.com slash thepowersweep. Donating $1 per month helps us keep the lights on here. And if you want to take your your support even farther than that, buy a shirt from our store at Teespring by clicking the shop link at thepowersweep.com. If you want to reach out and say hello, you know the way to do it on social media or via email by checking out the power sweep 1959 at gmail.com we do appreciate everybody who takes the time to reach out every bit of feedback every thought every suggestion you give us helps us make this entire operation better and helps us further our mission of helping everyone become smarter packers fans and as i always say smarter packers fans are better packers fans and better packers fans are what we all want to be i'm your host john meerdink we'll see you next time on blue 58